Welcome, everyone. It is time for RDA's Tech Q&A. We do bi-weekly here to uh, answer some of your tech questions. I am Nash. I do Radio Dead Air and also have well over a decade. What are you doing? Sorry, that's my cat. Um, I'm totally so professional. Screen, I'm green screen. Um, I have well over a decade's worth of tech experience at doing all of these things. And uh, this is my producer, Mike Gearman. He also oh. has a long and storied history in tech. We'll be answering some of your questions and looking at some of the news this week. And um, I'm going to just get off to a start. The, the first big news story that came out uh, this week, well, I say, I say a big news story. It's not kind of one we, we've, we've been expecting for a while, if you know anything about computers. Um, there's an old, old adage that's been called a law, but it's more of an adage that was started by, um, one of the co-founders of Intel, Gordon Moore. Ah, Moore's law, yes. Yeah. That said, um, the number of transistors on a microprocessor will double roughly every two years. That means... You might have said 18 months, but yeah. Yeah. That means every two years processors would get twice as fast and do twice as much. And ever since the 70s, it's been it's held kind of true until the 2000s, where we started to... Moore's Law has run up against physics, essentially. And that, that's the, the first thing. Everyone pretty much rushed to do this. We've declared the death of Moore's Law. Um been declared dead multiple times but this time they might mean it yeah see what's causing the problem at least in this um well well all right i guess the first thing i should explain is why moore's law is important for consumer electronics and the advancements of computing um when processors get faster and can do more that means prices continue to drop on older processors and newer processors are the... I'm hearing noises from my cat I don't like. It's probably not good, but I can't do anything about it. I'm live. Oh, no. Um, when processors get faster, that means prices drop. That means better for consumers. That means also we get more advanced systems for the high-end consumers. And we, we keep being able to do more and more with computers. Now, however, this we've run up against, um, and what I say by physics is they've been making process... Heat. What? By physics, you mean heat. Heat. Well, yeah. They've been making processors smaller and smaller and smaller by fitting more transistors on a processor. And they've been doing this by making the etching of those little transistors on a wafer, teeny, uber tiny. We're up to a 14 nanometer process right now, I believe. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, we're, we're at 14 nanometers, which is pushing the limits of what we can do. Now they've got a few more tricks to keep making them even smaller, but like Mike said, Heat becomes a problem because when you put so many transistors on a single processor, running electricity through them, that many transistors heats up that much fat, generates more heat, and getting the heat away from the processor so it doesn't self-destruct becomes more and more of a challenge. And we've reached the point where making transistors smaller is becoming an issue and dealing with the heat dissipation is becoming an issue. And building new factories to build new chips is becoming an issue. Yeah, that, that is, the, what was it? That, that's a corollary to Moore's Law. I forget who, who, came, who came up with it. It was uh, the price of a processor factory increases, doubles every four years is the corollary to Moore's Law. So they're getting more expensive to make now, there's also another issue, a smaller side issue, is that actually we've already kind of run up against this in the beginning of the 2000s. The solution that they came up with was cores. 
It was making yes. multiple process. When you hear uh, them talk about um, multi-core processors, what that actually means is there are multiple CPUs on a single processor all tied together. So when they talk about a four core system or a six core system or a dual core system, that means you don't have one CPU in your computer. You actually have multiples that are kind of all hitched together. And that was the workaround for Moore's law for a while. But even that has started to you know, result in diminishing returns because we still don't properly code for multiple processors. So we have multiple processors on a chip and your computer's not making use of all of those processors properly. Sure. I mean, if I bring up the system properties in my computer, a lot of stuff is on processor one or processor zero, however they number it. Yeah. And uh, significantly less on the others. Right. And we've had multi-core processors for over a decade now. They're, they're kind of a standard. And yet even Windows doesn't know what to do with the extra, unless you're using specific pro uh, programs like um, Adobe Premiere uses multi-core. Um, I believe AutoCAD does. <clears throat> some games are rare. Some games, very few games, make use of multiple processors. The result is we have all this computing power we're not even making proper use of. Be it through Windows or be it through um, <clears throat> developers just not accessing those cores and in some cases you don't necessarily need to i mean you, your word processing program probably is not going to be enhanced spectacularly no by you know multi-core no i mean we, we we for word processing you can do that on your phone and even your phone has multiple cores it's not using we've and been lots of extra heat yeah we've been doing word processing since computers first came out and and even in consumer models first came out the commodore 64 had word processing on it yeah the crash 80 had word processing it wasn't yeah. spectacular word processing you would tell it to do something like fully justify you know a, a block of code a block of text and you go huh why is there massive amounts of spaces between these words oh because it's fully justified and that's how it did it one line looks great the next line six words with you know a dozen spaces between each word. Oh, I remember. I, I had. Uh, I remember all the fun I used to have with WordPerfect five point one. Ah, uh, the good still prefer ones. WordPerfect to Word. So, what is this going to mean going forward for consumers? It means that uh, they're going to have to get better at writing code to take advantage of multiple cores to get speed increases out of. Uh, they're going to have to um, come up with new bells and whistles to convince people to buy stuff. Yeah, but in the meantime, what this means is we are going to see a flat stagnation in what processors actually do. Now, there's been some talk about a way to um, keep interest. You were talking about bells and whistles. They What they're Thinking about doing now is more processor integration. Um, because right now, things like uh, your GPS, your Wi-Fi, um, tons of other functions, your USB controller, all of these are handled on by separate chips uh, on a motherboard. Yeah, and there's a data path between the processor and those chips. What they've been talking about now is, what if we take those components and integrate them into the CPU and therefore, you know, whatever mediocre benefits that may offer, but it's a way to, you know, it's more bells and whistles. And of course that there are other segments of the tech world that are dedicated just to making those components who probably aren't going to be happy by this development. But there's not much they can do about it. No, this this is kind of where we're we're getting right now because, in terms of processing power, you could honestly right now use a five year old CPU, and not see that much processing gain over a mod its modern model equivalent. 
Um, I know lots of people still use uh, the 2600 core CPU from Intel because their replacements, let's see, it was the 3700, the 4700, now the 57, I think there's even a 60. The only benefits those actually offer are integrated graphics, which no one ever fucking uses. And, yeah. and only people who use integrated graphics are business offices. Yeah, integrated graphics, a little bit more overclocking depending on the model, and that's it. In terms of raw horsepower, they're pretty much on a par. Sure, the newer ones have a little bit of a boost, but nothing really to make someone go, you know, my five-year-old CPU is working just fine. I don't need a new one. Graphics cards probably still have a little room to, to go. Oh, graphics cards. Well, in graphics cards terms, um, at least with uh, NVIDIA, I know with their Pascal, they this is something that graphics cards do that processors kind of can't if they want to keep using um, x86 and you know code is the graphics cards completely reconfigure how they work. Um, remember when CUDA cores were introduced from NVIDIA? Yeah. And they they, keep, they can completely redesign a graphics card, just write new drivers for it, and it'll keep working with existing hardware. So graphics cards have a leg up on that. They can just redo how their processors work entirely for more, you know, for and, better. And graphics cards applications are also more independent in that what's happening on one sub part of your screen can be calculated completely separately from what's happening on another part of your screen. And so you can, you can multi-thread more effectively. But the bottom line for people buying computers is this means processors are going to be not much better than old ones and still cost more. So this is kind of a bad time. What's going to change? Probably, I don't know. It's it's going to take a while to see if anything changes. We'll see if any new net top, yeah, new technologies help out in this in this area. Any? Yeah. It's not like Intel's got much, you know, impetus to compete very much. Well, not when their only competitor is AMD. No. While we're talking about competition, and oh, isn't it amazing what competition can do? Um, is this going to be a Google Fiber story? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's a hilarious one. It's one that made me very, very happy. Um, so Google announced it's going to be expanding Google Fiber into Atlanta, Georgia. Good market for it. They haven't even gotten there yet. And already... Comcast is losing their shit, and they're losing their shit in a spectacularly stupid way. And this is this. I'm gonna guess this is a. Oh God, please stay with us. We don't suck. We yeah. promise we don't suck. Except they suck at explaining how they don't suck. It comes to us from Ars Technica. Comcast begs Atlanta customers not to switch to Google Fiber. Now, this is a flyer that was distributed to homes in Atlanta. And I want you to read what, they, what they're trying to say is the benefits of Comcast. Number one, the fastest in-home Wi-Fi. Okay, that's if you use their in-house box compared to anyone else's in-house box. And don't go to, say, your local big box store and buy your own box. Wi-Fi has nothing to do, zero to do, with what comes from your actual internet provider. And Zero. They're all pretty much the same speed at this point. Yep. So saying we have the fastest is like, how? How are you fast? Your, 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 your box that you provide that you charge a stupid amount of money for is what, 1% faster maybe than Time Warner's box? Yeah. And, and they haven't really tested, I, I don't know how they've tested Google's, because uh, obviously a modem from Google has to be a little bit different. It's a fiber modem as opposed to, to a cable modem. They don't list what faster means. They just put little blue check. Um, Next up, nine times more free TV shows and movies on demand. Okay, so... There's multiple services out there. Mm -hmm. Multiple. There's Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, YouTube. So, say, so saying they're saying we've made a great deal with 
our own in-house thing because we're owned by NM, uh, NBC or they own NBC. I forget which way it goes. So everything that NBC has, we have made free to you, but you can find online anywhere else anyway. Yeah. So a And since you're paying so much less for Google Fiber, you can probably afford to pick up Netflix. DVR recordings to go. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that means. Who cares about... Does, does, does that mean something you recorded on your DVR you can watch on your tablet or your, your phone later? You, you can do that with Netflix. Yeah. You can do that with YouTube. You can do that with anything. Yeah. Um, and the last one is so sad. The X1 voice remote. Ah, uh, yes. The X1 voice remote. Comcast, fuck off. <laughs> Look, the box turned off. They're, they're, they're... I don't know if it actually does that. If, if you have a Comcast X1 voice remote at home, tell it to fuck off and, and let us know the results. They're trying to say... Email Nash with the results. No. They're trying <laughs> to say having a voice... Their voice remote makes their internet service... No. Here, here let's, let's go down to the brass tacks of what makes their service better. Basic internet for Google. This is what they consider basic on their uh, their fiber service. Okay. 100 megabits per second, $50 a month. Is that up and down? Yes. Do you know how much I have seven, I have, I'm stuck with Comcast. I go through them. I get the fastest they offer, um, at least on cable, is 75 up. And I think, no, 75 down, and I think 10 up. That cost me $80 a month. So you get a massive increase. Going. And a price cut. Yeah. So there's some disclaimers at the bottom of this little flyer here. Yeah. The, the standard restrictions apply, not available in all areas. Okay, that's, that's sort of legalese default. TV, on-demand su selection subject to uh, charge indicated at time of purchase. So they charge you some amount so it's not free. Right. Um, Wi-Fi claim based on September and November 2014 yeah. studies at a test lab. So it's a year-old study. Yep. Actual speeds vary and are not guaranteed. And so, okay. so, so wait, their fastest in-home Wi-Fi, actual speeds vary, not guaranteed. That's their, that's their, we tested it in a lab, which didn't have walls between where we were testing things. You have walls, your signal may be less. Uh, and call for, oh, that's the standard other bullshit. And the best part of this is if you want gigabit, that's a thousand megabits per second up and down synchronous uh, connection. That's $70 a month. I pay 80 for far less. For less than a tenth. A tenth. And oh. you're in Shermer. We gotta get. We got. We suggest to Google that they should wire Shermer next. They should. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody. Email Google, and tell them they need to provide uh, Google Fiber to Shermer, Illinois. Do that immediately, right now, please. I'm begging you. That's going to be fun. Um. What the fuck is this Shermer shit? I don't understand. We keep getting requests for Google Fiber to Shermer, Illinois. God damn it. It is one of the anniversaries of Pretty in Pink. It is. It is. Um, so, god damn, Comcast is so desperate. This is what Comcast thinks me competition means. This is how they compete. Oh, bless your heart, you don't even remember what competition is, do you? You don't, you, you, you not even a little bit. Oh, hey, Grady. Have you done destroying whatever you were destroying? Am I going to have I, a mess to find later? I saw a white tail and that was it. Yeah, that's him. Um, so he's coming near you now. Yeah. Well, no. Now he's leaving. No, no, say, but he comes near you now. Well, yeah, because I have food. Does he still run away if you put on a jacket or shoes? Yes, he still does, because he associates that with the vet, which means he's going to get a thermometer in his butt, so he runs away. 
course. Okay, it does, out of any, by any chance, does thermometer in the butt somehow seg into our next tech story? No, it does not. Damn. Although it would be great if it did. That'd be like, wow, how did you do that? But no. Our next one comes from video games, and but it actually has a wider implication in terms of rights management and the real world. We, we, we already had a story a while back about the, the EU. No, it was the UK was wanted to um, extend licensing rights for photographs you take of designed objects you, you were gonna have to yeah if, if you had a designer chair you know some uh five thousand dollar chair i don't know who pays five thousand dollars for a chair but okay let's say you did yeah and you took a picture of your cousin bob in that chair the person who designed the chair could say no you can't post that on facebook i made that chair yeah well take two studios uh had it had a more this is one this one could spill out into the really real world, which is just, oh God, this makes my fucking head hurt. Is this the tattoos one? This is the tattoos one. This comes to us from Destructoid. Ta Tattoo Studio sues Take-Two Interactive for $1.1 million. Okay, so I got the basics on this one. Let me see if I get this right. Very many sports games, their selling point is the fact that they have actual sports people in them. It's mm -hmm. not just nine generic guys or however many is on a given sports team. Right. It's what, five basketball? I don't know. It's 11 football, whatever it is. And they want to represent them and they use the real stats. And they got sued a, a while back over the fact that they were using real stats and real likenesses. And there was licensing issues back and forth over what they could use and what they couldn't use. And now the tattoo studio, this one, well, it's one tattoo studio as far as I know, is saying, hey, that, that basketball player there, you're showing the tattoos we put on him. We want some monies. Yeah? Yeah, that pretty, that pretty much is it. The tattoo studio claims that the value of the tattoo is $800,000. The studio wants $1.1 million to permit perpetual licenses to use the designs. Okay, so my, now, keep in mind, there's, what they're claiming here is probably copyright, yeah? Yes, this is exactly a copyright issue. Okay, so the short version of intellectual property, there's four kinds of intellectual property, copyright, trademark, uh, patent, and trade secret. Mm -hmm. Copyright, anytime you infringe a copyright, theoretically, you could owe a lot of money. Right. In practice, outside the music industry, they don't generally ask for as much as you could owe because they recognize they're not going to get that. Mm. Unless Whereas they're trying to scare the fuck out of people with those... Here, little secret. All of these million-dollar or multi-million-dollar lawsuits and whatnot that get settled, they're normally settled for much lower, but they use that big multi-million-dollar number to scare the fuck out of the public. So, my problem here... Very few people outside of like fraternities and sororities and you know, people just going, oh, I want a tattoo on the spur of a moment, mm. walk into a tattoo shop saying, I want that one there. And they point to something on the wall. Mm. Quite a lot of people go in with the design. They go in, I want something that does this. And the tattoo artist works with them to make it work. Now, sometimes they go, here's a picture of my kid. Put the picture of my kid on me. And then we get sad tattoos, which is a and wonderful Yeah, then we website. get really screwed up tattoos, oh, yes. such as uh, Nazi unicorns. And I'm not joking, there is a Nazi unicorn tattoo. There is. And then there's my favorite tattoo of all times, which is two pieces of bacon in the shape of a cross with an egg at the center, crucified on the bacon, and the word IHOP over top of it instead of Inri, like you'd see on Christian iconography. Someone but, has that on them forever. Yes. So, my thought on this one, though, is whatever sports personalities go into a tattoo shop, they go in and say, hey, do this. How is this not a work for hire? How is this not, I'm paying you to do this on me. It's my design. It's 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 screwy to me. I don't. Here's, I can't wrap my head around it. 
here's the one where it spills out into the real world. If this is, goes through and establishes a precedent, it is entirely possible then that tattoo artists, if you take a picture of someone who has their tattoo on them, a photograph in, a, in public, if you take a picture of that person, a tattoo artist could sue you for, for copyright damages, licensing damages, for taking a picture of someone with their tattoo on them. It's not a stretch to say that could, could happen next. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very strange. It's not strange. It's fucking rent-seeking bullshit. This, it's like, how do I find a new way to make money off the backs of other people with this one thing I created? And this is... And, and, and here's the thing. Okay, so this guy is arguing. Whatever, who is, who's the art? Who's the football, not football, basketball player? So, um, uh, LeBron James. LeBron James on the cover of whatever basketball game this was. And his tattoos are visible. Obviously, that the, the game company had LeBron come in. They had him do the pose, whatever, which they made artistic. And they, they put it on the cover and they put him in the game. So they scanned and they digitized the images. And the tattoo company here is saying, it is a selling point that these tattoos are on. No, it's not. No one is buying the game because LeBron's tattoos are in the game. Absolutely nobody. They're buying the game because it is the 2014 edition or the 20 whatever whatever yeah. edition of the game and it has LeBron James in it. Yeah. Maybe they're buying it for LeBron, but they're not buying it for LeBron's tattoos. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, take two could just change the skin and alter the tattoos and then, you know, it's fine. But that doesn't speak to the larger legal point, the implications of like for example, I don't know if that, someone looked this up. Do sports broadcasters have to pay licensing rights no. to tattoo art? Well, they could argue if if this establishes a precedent, they could legally argue that a, a game broadcast is required to pay a licensing fee to the tattoo artist based on whoever's on the fucking court. I think it's covered under, oh no. It's a very good question and I don't think we're gonna have an answer. Uh, just, well, why don't we get to some questions we do have answers for? Why don't we do sure. that? We can do that. All you right. may not like our answers, but we're going to have answers. We're going to have answers. Sometimes we have to say, oh, I'm sorry. That 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 is that is one of our, our classifications of answers here on Tech Q&A. Um, if you have questions for us, send it to request at radiodeadair.com. Put Tech Q&A in the subject line. We will attempt to... to, to uh, answer these for you and like i said some of these are going to be sorry i don't have a good answer for you some of these however are not I, we've got uh, our first one comes to us from john he says i host pen and paper rpgs with friends over skype one of my favorite things to do is play mood music to help set the scene right now i just uh get by on sending youtube links but not only is this really on other people actually clicking the links sometimes songs aren't available on youtube I was wondering if there's a way to pipe the audio music out of a music player such as Winamp or iTunes uh, into the, the audio stream Skype would use for a microphone input. I imagine it's all some sort of software audio device, but I haven't been sure where to start looking. Well, John, we have a good answer for you. Okay, before we get to the good answer, yes, yes, there's a way to do it. Whether that way is 100% legal with copyright, we don't know. But, fuck them. I They're probably know. not coming after you anyway. Yeah. Um, there is a very... Uh, I actually looked this up. This comes to us via a website called Make Use Of. Very simple way of doing it. Well, it's simple but tedious, like most things in tech. <laughs> um, it's a, a program called Voice Meter. Voice Meter. M-E-E-T-E-R. You get it? Voice Meter. Um, and... You can find more of this. Uh, go to, look. Up, go to makeuseof.com and search for Voice Meter on their website um, because they've they've written a fantastic article that's long and detailed and explains exactly how to do this. 
basically what this does is it creates a virtual audio device on your computer, a virtual soundboard, more or less. And you wire your microphone, in, not literally wire, but what it does is it takes your microphone input and your playback input on your desktop and pipes it into one little virtual soundboard. And then you tell Skype, that's your input device. Instead of your mic, you make this your input device. Now, how is that going to work if you have want to be able to talk as well? Well, they can they can hear you both because it, it's okay. like a soundboard. It's like uh like you know an actual soundboard mixer with with uh with slides and levels and whatnot. You can adjust the volume of your microphone. You can adjust the volume of the music. You can bounce them out however you need to, and it's so simple. Just it's a matter of setting it up. That's the problem, which I will refer to you to make use of. Wonderful website. It's got step-by-step -step instructions on how to set this up for Skype. It will let you play the music across Skype. Everyone on the Skype call will be able to hear it, and they'll also be able to hear your microphone. It's a simple, easy solution for you, and it's, I believe, let's see, is it free? I want to make sure. Um, how much does this cost? Does this cost anything? Um, it's free. Yes, voice meter is free. So, there you go. Although you can pay for it if you choose to. Yes, but there is a free version that will do everything you need it to. It just won't have as many plugins, you know, as many hard inputs for it. But it will make your shit less tedious. So, hooray! Right, and VB Audio is the people who make that. These are also the people who made Virtual Audio Cable. Which, yes, which I use for some things. Yeah, so it's it's good shit here, people. This is good shit. This this will solve your problems. Yay! I'm glad we actually got one where we could help. Yay! <laughs> All right. What is what other questions do we have here tonight? Um, now I have one where we can't. Ah, this comes from Almighty K. Updated my PC from Windows 7 to Windows 10, 64-bit, in December when the update came out. I have not had too many problems, but occasionally Explorer and related Windows would freeze up when trying to open the context menu. Right-click. Yes, your mouse has two buttons, in case those of you at home, if you, if you didn't know. Unless they have a Mac. Two buttons. Well, please. We're talking about Windows, Mike. Yeah. We're talking about this Windows. Windows. Mouse has two buttons. Two buttons. Um, I have used Shell X View before, which uh, allows you to add other contacts. But it's it's uh, it allows you to do some adaptations and stuff on Windows to add additional context menus. Um, or turning off extra stuff. Yeah, yeah, you can shut them off. And we would. Uh, Use Shell X, that would solve the problem. Recently started again, even though I have not installed anything that would affect my context menu, it could still happen with every item turned off in Shell X view. Um, to uh, let's see, is it possible something went wrong with the install of context menus in the Windows 10 install? Yes. It is definitely, there might be, this, we, we've talked about this before. Why upgrading may be convenient but not very good for your system. It's the Windows Registry. The Windows Registry is that big long list of details and file locations and settings that Windows uses to tell every program and operation it does where things are, how to do it, what the, yeah, everything all about that. Unfortunately, when you upgrade from one version of Windows to, to the next, it brings the registry with it. And sometimes, because magic gremlins in your fucking computer, sometimes that registry won't translate 100% to the newer version of Windows. As a result, when Windows, say in this instance, the context menu settings, when Windows goes to look at those context menu settings, they're slightly wrong. And if they're slightly wrong, Windows just goes, well, fuck it. Windows, you'll find out Windows quite often has a velocity of, well, fuck it. 
I'll just do it however the fuck I want. Fuck it. Because the registry, the registry is just, be, it's like a dysfunctional relationship between Windows and its own registry. They need marriage counseling because quite often one of them will have a conflict with the other and the response is to just throw up their hands and well, fuck it. And you suffer. You, the child, suffers. It's like, it's like a dysfunctional marriage. That's the weirdest, the weirdest allegory for anything I've ever done computerized here. Um, so Almighty K, what can you do about it? Do you want to tell them the bad news, Mike? You might have to do a full a clean install. Yeah. There is a there you said you use Shell X View. There's another similar program called Shell Menu View. It does basically the same thing. You might give it a try just to see if it shows you different results. Because one program might catch something, the other one doesn't. But you're likely looking at what you're likely looking at is between your install and your initial use of Shell X View, Microsoft pushed a patch mm. of some sort which made a change to a context menu. And I want to point out that only just this week when Microsoft has started adding patch notes again. Yes. For, before, for before, before this week, it was, we're going to patch your Windows 10 box. Trust us, you don't need to know what it's doing. Yeah, they didn't tell you what they changed. They didn't tell you what they fixed or altered they just made changes with no patch notes so there could have been a patch that fucked this up you won't know because they only just now said oh maybe we need patch notes well then the only reason they did that is because they got a lot of pushback from corporate environments saying we need to know what's going on right corporate and government yeah man why do you need patch notes so much extra work for us god damn it so, in it, it the, unfortunately, Almighty K, the bad news here, and I'm sorry to say it, you're just, uh, if the other program that Mike recommends does not help, you're likely looking at a full Yeah, it, it's from the same company that, made, uh, that makes the one you use. So, it's just a slightly different way of looking at things. Um, uh, Shell XView, I think, is actually the more powerful one, but it's, it's, it's worth a shot to take a look. It is probably a patch-related change that caused it, and you won't know which one, yeah. and you really can't tell which one. So fingers crossed that does it for you, but normally when it comes to installing an operating system, I always recommend a clean installation. Always. When you, never upgrade. Never. If you, can, if you can ever help it, never upgrade your system because shit like this has the possibility of happening. And it will le it will give you headaches. You will tear your hair out, and eventually you're just gonna have to do a clean install anyway. <sighs> All right, Lox. Let's see who's next. Loxseed. Yeah, Loxseed has the next question for us. Dear Nash and Mike, wondering if you guys give me some advice on getting a VPN. I want to set up one for my laptop and my router at home, but I worried that will do to my what it will do to my connection speeds. And it will affect how it will affect my relationship with my ISP. Who? Which is unfortunately Comcast. Yeah. Select. Uh, is it is it Netflix that just recently started saying, "Oh, you're using a VPN. We can't show you anything." Well, yeah, they said they're going to, but they still haven't quite rolled that out yet. Thankfully, because I still use mine. But that's going to be across the industry, and and the VPNs have already said they are going to push back against it. Um. But that aside. Selecting a VPN is a lot like buying a car. You're not going to know unless you actually go and drive the car. You now, a lot of the VPN paid services out there have a free trial. Yeah. And uh, I don't have any I can recommend because I don't use them. You should. Uh, you should. I, I don't have any need. I don't have the, the connection stuff that you do. Well, no, even with the connection stuff, I, it's 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 still better because I don't fucking trust the routing on my fucking ISP. They're mm -hmm. bastards. They're all bastards. I hate them. Um, I personally, I'll tell you what I use. I use ExpressVPN. It works very well for me. Why might it not work for you? Well, um, if you have privacy concerns, it's based in the U.S. and they do keep system logs. 
That doesn't bother me because I'm not doing anything that would be considered illegal. However, that does mean that potentially the NSA or somebody could go and and subpoena them for records about me and shit. I don't know why the fuck they would. I'm not that fucking interesting, but they could. Um, also, it is $13 a month. Now, it's worth it to me for a lot of reasons, especially when I have connection issues and shit. It might not be worth it for you. I will tell you, however, their speeds are very, very good. I, I barely, if ever, notice I have a problem um, with downloading or uploading when I'm connected to a VPN. I often, quite often, upload that way. Um, so ExpressVPN, for me, is pretty good. For you, there is a way. If you Google best VPN, you'll, your very first result... I'll bring it up here on on screen to show you. It's um, probably a company named Best VPN. BestVPN.com. Um, it is a site that has lists of VPNs based on uh, Best VPN for USA, for Windows, for Mac, for iOS. Uh, See, I thought it was going to be a VPN company named Best VPN. No, it's actually it it gives you lists of best for Netflix, best for encrypted. Best for your specific purposes and needs. They have a bunch of them all rated there. Your it's it also your reasons for using a VPN can vary wildly. Is it speed issues? Is it privacy issues? Is it you know all sorts of different things? This site will help you break down which one might be able to help and might not. That's bestvpn.com. Um my own personal experience, ExpressVPN has done fine for me. Hopefully that helps you. Hopefully, hopefully, maybe, possibly. Um, next one comes to us from Micro. He says, uh, due to my refund coming in, I'm thinking of upgrading my CPU and motherboard as they are around five years old. It feels like a good time to upgrade. So what would your guys' recommendations, recommendations for a high to mid-level CPU and motherboard with lots of PCI slots? Here's where we run into the problem. He says, RAM isn't an issue. Okay, that's where you might be wrong. Yeah. And the reason you might be wrong is if you're running a five-year-old uh, computer, you might be on a different uh, memory format than what you could buy now. Oh, he's definitely using DDR3. I, I'm, willing, so I'm willing to bet. Do he didn't say that, but I'm willing to bet dollars to the donuts. It's at least DDR3. Okay. It could have been the end of DDR2. But I believe, you may correct me on this, most of Intel's offerings, their brand new stuff, is all DDR4 now. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked. I believe most of, of... If you want to buy something new, as in brand new out of the box, you're quite likely looking at a DDR4 solution. Um, but there's still plenty of good DDR3s available. Yeah, there there may still be some DDR3s available, um, but that is something you're going to have to take into account um, because if you're talking about the best of the best, most of the newest ones are running DDR4. That's that's their best of the best. Um, also, yeah, that's what I'm seeing out here on Newegg. I'm just going to Newegg saying what's available. Yeah, and uh, I'm not seeing an option yet. To say, oh, there we go, memory standard. Okay, so that's looks like it's all DDR. No, oh, there's some DDR3 options. So there are a few DDR3 options. Uh, they are gen, gen. Okay, there's some DDR3 1600. Um, yeah. But yeah, so there are options out there for you. Uh, if you're looking for uh, something, I, I would go. Obviously, shop around, but I go to a site like Newegg, something that has a mm. very strong uh, user review community. Yeah, and I would look for something. You know, you put in your qualifications. DDR three, obviously, is what you want going to want to check. You know, it's a checkbox on there, and uh, look for something. I would say at four stars or higher. Um. Anyway, um, I, I I've had a lot of luck with. Gigabyte and Asus motherboards. Yeah. In the past, they're really solid. Well, I um, have heard lately that some of Gigabyte has been having some BIOS issues lately. Yeah. Um, the 
If you want to, very solid, uh, you can look for stuff that's marked with the Republic of Gaming yeah. logo, but you're going to pay a little bit of extra for that because they're saying they're putting their stamp of approval on it. They're charging for that. Yeah, Asus, Asus tends to be a good one overall. Um, also, another good one is uh, MSI. People Pretty solid. Asus, MSI, and Gigabyte, even though Gigabyte's losing a little bit of shine because of their BIOS issues lately, um, those three tend to be some of the most solid. You know, there, there are some other ones like uh, Ace Rock and others, but they tend to be kind of on the low end of things. Um, does Intel still make their own motherboards? They used I to. I don't know. I don't know either. But um, uh, Yes, according to Newegg, there's 15 that they have right now that are... Intel branded. Yeah. Um, in terms of CPU, mid to high level, well, that's pretty simple. Mid is i5, high is i7. It depends on what you're using it for. I'm assuming you're, you're going to be doing... Oh, let me correct this. Uh, none of these are really spectacular motherboards with the Intel brand on them. Well, no. Intel just makes motherboard that work. Yeah. Intel brand is just motherboard work. Done. Um, you, uh, it, it all depends on what you need. If you aren't doing anything more than gaming on your system, an Intel i5 is all you need. Now, the speeds are, with Intel's, uh, numbering system, the speeds are relative to the higher numbers. So an Intel i5, uh, what are the i5, 2500 or whatever, 500 or whatnot. I think we're... I Twenty one eleven, isn't it? No, I'm talking about the, the the model number. Oh, the model number. I think we're at the we're are we at the forty five hundreds or the fifty five hundreds. They keep fucking up. The bigger high, number better. Yeah, the bigger number has got a faster clock rate, so that's the that, that's how you tell them, um, speed wise apart. Um, if you're gaming, an i5 is all you need. If you're doing stuff like video editing or AutoCAD or other stuff that, that requires hyper-threading, you might want to look at an i7. Um, and that would really pretty much go and look at the minutia to determine... Yeah, you didn't, you didn't give us a dollar value here. You said, yeah. you said you know, I, I'm just getting a, a tax refund. Um, but you should be able to get a really nice motherboard and processor for probably about six hundred dollar range. Yeah, yeah, you'd be fine. We don't. So. E we're not even talking about AMD because because why? Yeah, if you're going to be plunking down that kind of money for a system, I think you want something that performs. And AMD's performance to dollar ratio compared to Intel is not quite as good. Yeah, so you can get a a really decent i5 for two hundred to two fifty maybe. Uh, and a really good motherboard for about the same. Yeah, or and you know what? L really look at what's on the motherboard because sometimes there's a lot of features on a motherboard you are never going to use. If you see a feature on a motherboard that looks kind of what the fuck would I ever use that for? Don't get it. Get the get a step get one model step down. I promise you, you should you'll probably be fine. Um, I, it's unless you know specifically what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, all right, our last question comes from George. He says, Hi, Nash and Mike. Over the holidays, I got a cheap desktop computer that came with onboard graphics, but no actual graphics card. I want to add one, but I limit it by small form factor and low wattage power supply. Do you have any suggestions? Oh, God, I looked at the power supply. Uh, yeah, 250 watt. 240? 240. 240 watt. Oh, oh. That's, that's enough to run the motherboard, oh, certainly. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, Ooh, that's, I mean, you're, you're asking a good one there because I mean, you're not, you're not going to have, uh, I can play, uh, World of Warcraft or any of the online shooting games with all the bells and whistles loaded with that power supply. Yeah. Cause most of the power supply, most of the uh, graphics cards, nice graphics cards out there require that much, uh, power all on their own. Yeah, even, I, I want to say, even the go-to for this that I would normally go to on this one, the GTX 750, which is a pretty good performer in the low range, even that one requires a 300-watt power supply. 
So right, the power supplies in a computer are very, very important. They dictate how much energy is available to each particular component. And in this case, I'm going to look up this system here. You are hard, you, you are very, very, very limited by the uh, the power supply. It's an HP Compact. Remember when those two were two different companies? Oh, God, yeah. It's an HP con Compact I remember. 6, I remember before uh, they got ruined. Yeah. Pro small form factor. Oh, I hate small form factor. Hate, 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 hate small form factor. Let's have a look at this thing. Um... My friend, we may have bad news for you here. You might be out of luck. You might be fucked. The problem with small form factor is in any other circumstance, I would recommend replacing both the replacing the power supply and then getting a new video card. That might might run you an extra $50 or so, 50 or $60, but you would be able to, to put in pretty much any video card you wanted. Yeah. A small form factor, you don't have the room to do anything. Or, especially small form factor, the way small form factor, at least for coming from a big box store, uh, you can build your own small form factor and use a full-size regular power supply, it's no problem. But when they come pre-made, what they tend to do is they will add in a proprietary power supply. What do we mean by proprietary? Well, I mean it's a non-standard size that only comes from that company and only fits in that computer. You can't go buy one off the shelf and replace it. If the power supply goes out, you have to get another one from HP because they don't, they're not standardized. Every, every other computer, most computers are kind of standardized, especially the power supply. It's a regular little square, all, sort of rectangular. It's, well, it's not a perfect square. It's kind of a rectangular cube. Um, and it's made to fit, they make them so that it will fit in just about any computer case. But with proprietary, I've seen these in Dell systems, especially the, the older small form factor Dells. Instead of being a little cube, it's this kind of tube kind of thing. It's longer than a normal power supply, it's thinner than a normal power supply, and it doesn't work as well as a normal power supply. Well, that's sort of a description of Dell in general. And Will is saying, transplant the parts to a bigger case. No, that won't work. You know why? Because all the mounting points for that motherboard are in a different location than they would be for a case. Oh, there's another reason, too. The switches. When you, you in your normal computer, when you push the power button on your computer, what that actually is, is a switch connected to a long wire that plugs into a specific pair of pins on your motherboard. And those, those are, again, are standard across most of the, you buy a motherboard, you buy a case, you put it in, you plug it in, bang. Those are kind of standardized across the industry. Those, those plugs are in a certain place, and it, they're two little prongs, you plug in the switch, and you're done. Except when we're talking about these proprietary small form factor units. They put the switch, they'll either make the switch in two different places, one positive, and, and, and is it positive or ground, or positive and negative? I, I forget which one it is. But they'll put, the, they'll put the pins far away from each other, and they'll make the switch connection this weird block that will only plug into that motherboard. So you have to buy that motherboard to fit that case. That case won't work with any other motherboard. That motherboard won't work with any other case. It, yeah, it would, Kelly Elf said, would it be easier to buy just a whole new system? Yup. Uh, when you're going shopping for a computer, I know those small form factor systems look like such a great deal. And you know what? If you're getting it for grandma, for Facebook, if you're getting it for you, for just for Facebook and, and web browsing and whatnot, you'll probably be fine. But if you ever want to do anything more with a small form factor, you're probably out completely out of luck. It's almost as bad as if you're trying to upgrade the video in a laptop. 
because that that's that is the big problem with proprietary systems. Off the shelf tends not to work with these things. I'm and 240 watt power supply. That is a cheap little piece of shit they put in there. I am so sorry. You got hosed, my friend. You got hosed hard, and I'm very sorry to say it. Our best recommendation, and I'll t Mike, Mike might disagree with me, but our best recommendation is you might need to get a new computer. Yeah, I'm trying to find a good picture of this power supply online. I looked at the case, and, and just by the case. I'm not size. looking at the case. I found the power supply part number. Oh, you did? Okay. And yes, it is a screwball shape. It is oh, a. Oh, no. Instead of, Give me the instead link, of, I'll put it on, on the screen. Okay. This is off the uh, New Egg site. And oh. um, that's, uh, that's a Tetris piece of a shape. Would you? What the fuck is that? Look at that shit. All right, I want to compare a normal computer power supply. That is the power supply for your system. Here's a normal power supply. Let's let's show you the picture. This is what this is what a regular computer power supply looks like. See, it's it's a uh, it's sort of an off rectangular. That's the standardized one. This is the one they put in. It's a Tetris piece. It's a what is that shit? And I, what I especially like about that, my favorite piece of this power supply, is the fact that they obviously could not find a fan that was short enough mm -hmm. for the power supply. So they said, we'll just use a regular full-size fan and bolt it on and make a Tetris piece. This is some old bullshit. No, actually, no, what they did was, I'll tell you what they did. They doubled the power supply cooling fan and this, you see the, the, the screens on the back of it? The power yeah. supply cooling fan doubles as a system cooling fan. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Because you can see through there and that's a screen. That's some old bullshit. And you know what? I bet someone at HP Compact got a raise for this. That's some old bullshit. So, yeah, sadly, you will not be able to upgrade that system. You will not be able to upgrade the video card in that system. It's, it's essentially you've got yourself a glorified laptop just without a screen and a keyboard built in. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you, you keep it, you set it aside, use it as a, a, a low power file share. It, it'll work for you. Um, and fortunately, here's, here's the only piece of good news for you. Should your power supply go south on you, it's only $64 to replace it. Only 60, do you know what kind of power supply you could get for $64? Not the first clue. You could get a 700 watt power supply for $65. Not a great one, but a decent one from like Antec or somebody. That would be a reliable unit for that kind of money. You could get a really good, you know, all the bells and whistles, 500 watt for 65. Now, that's I, some let, old bullshit. Let, let me state there is one other option for you. I do not recommend this option. My brother did this option. Oh, God. Oh no. He had the power supply sitting external to the computer and the cabling running in. It would work. It would no, actually no. Look at those connectors uh on, on that you, power. You, you would need extensions. No, not extensions. Look at the connectors. Uh I see a six pin, I see a four pin, I see uh That's a non standard power connector for for the main power. Son of a bitch. The power connectors, the 6-pin and 4-pin are the ones for the uh, CPU. Those are standard. The rest of the system, non-standard power connector. That's some old bullshit on that thing. Okay, so you can only do this if you also knew how to solder. Yep. Yep. So it, go, it went from this level of not recommending to this level of not recommending. 
You could do it, but don't blame us if shit sets shit. Yeah, I'm there. I'm very sorry, dude. I'm very sorry, George. You got hosed on this system. Um, you really did get. I I don't know what else to tell you. I'm I'm so. I'm so sorry. You're probably looking at having to replace this computer. Um, my apologies. There's not much really you can do with it. Oh, it's an AMD computer too. Yeah, it's it's this just um that is that is uh. That is bullshit. Well, folks, sorry to go on a sour note for you, but uh, that that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Um, that is such a Tetris piece, too. That is bullshit. <sighs> and the reason, by the way, the reason it's that height is so that will that will slide in. It almost certainly slides in from the back, and so it's not hitting any of the other components. And the second half of that fan is blowing or pulling air, whichever, over the the CPU and the memory. Slides in from the back so it won't hit any of the components. Wow, wow.